your money, your business. This is Financial Poise Radio, the spoken word sister of FinancialPoise.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Financial Poise Radio. I am Christopher Cahill, your host. In a few, we'll be interviewing Jeff Kelly of Equity Institutional and John Drockman, an award-winning writer and Series 7 registered representative. This will be about retirement investing, specifically about the Department of Labor's fiduciary rules, which are intended to limit the advisory activity of certain players in the market, and how that will affect private equity investing for your retirement accounts. That might sound a little counterintuitive. Private equity in investing sounds dangerous, and that's not supposed to be, you know, maybe not supposed to be permitted in retirement investing. Well, it is permitted under certain circumstances. Mr. Kelly operates a custodial service. He doesn't provide advice, but he can help afford an investor an opportunity to invest in private equity if that investor thinks, as some of you may, that as troubled as private equity is now, it may over the long term provide higher returns for your retirement dollar. So I encourage you to hang around and listen. First, for that, let's talk about molecular machines. Why? Because the title of the article says it all. Trio wins Nobel Chemistry Prize for work on molecular machines. This was an article by Sarah Kaplan, Washington Post, October 5, 2016. Who were these three chemistry geniuses. They were Jean-Pierre and R. Jean-Pierre Sauvage, J. Fraser Stoddart, and Bernard Feringa. Sauvage is from Strasbourg, France. Stoddart is from Edinburgh, Scotland, and Feringa is from Holland. So molecular machines, what are they? Well, they operate on a scale 1,000th the size of a width of human hair. So take a human hair, cut it lengthwise a thousand times, and one of those pieces will be about the size of a molecular machine. These are specially designed molecules. We're designing molecules now with movable parts that produce controlled movements when energy is added. Feringa, the Dutchman, built on breakthroughs in 1999, 17 years ago, to create the world's first molecular motor, a tiny spinning blade that rotates continually on an axis. That molecule was developed into a nanocar whose four wheels rotate to move the microscopic structure forward along a plane, like a minuscule car with four wheel drive. I'm quoting from the article. Beringa also showed that the molecule could be used to rotate a glass rod thousands of times larger than the motor itself. Keringa said, and I quote, I feel a bit like the Wright brothers. People were saying, why do we need a flying machine? Now we have a Boeing 747 and an Airbus. That's a little bit how I feel. The opportunities are great. And you can imagine the creation of materials with small molecular motors. I think we've talked about that before on this. Also, Why couldn't molecular motors be introduced into the bloodstream or some other part of the human body to solve problems with tumors and so on? I'm thinking of a 50-year-old movie called Fantastic Voyage from 1966, directed by Richard Fleischer, starring Stephen Boyd, Raquel Welch, Edmund O'Brien, the excellent Donald Pleasance, and a very young James Brolin, who later... uh, and I think is still with Barbara Streisand. Anyway, this movie won two Oscars, Best Art Direction and Best Effects. The plot basically was that a valuable spy for the US was injured, I think shot and and had a blood clot in the brain. And a submarine with the, basically the cast inside, shrunk into microscopic size and injected into the spy's bloodstream They had one hour to deal with the clot in the brain. 
Well, now run some nano cars, have them drive up and down the super highways of the human body and deal with things with greater uh, dispatch. So let's move from the sublime of contemporary technology to the brutal reality of personal finance and investing fundamentals, which will serve as something of an introduction to the guests today. Personal Finance and Investing Fundamentals 2.0 is the name of a webinar series to be offered on Financial Poise webinars in 2017 from September through December. Episode two of the four-part series is entitled How to Read Financial Statements and Financial Journalism. And I moved to talk about this now, even though it's pretty far in the future, because of some recent, fairly recent articles I've encountered that are ferociously relevant to these two themes. So financial statements and financial journalism, how to read them. First, financial statements. In June, the Wall Street Journal excerpted from a book, a very interesting account of problems with the reported earnings entry on financial statements. The name of the book is The End of Accounting. There's more to the title, but I don't want to read the whole thing. The End of Accounting by Baruch Lev and Feng Gun, 2016 Wiley Publishing. Reported earnings, as you might imagine, is a very important item on a financial statement. It's something on which anybody would focus, but especially those whose business it is to focus on such things. And well, what goes into reporting earnings? It's very complicated, maybe even selective. And certainly, according to these authors, too backward looking and unreliable. Take one example. Reported earnings includes long term items, which would indicate sustained growth or sustained losses, but also one time items like the sale of a division, which will bring in all kinds of capital and inflate the reported earnings figure, or restructuring costs. The paying of lawyers and other professionals can be very very substantial and that one-time charge can make a firm look weaker than it is especially if the restructuring itself improved the fundamentals of the business and the argument further is that some important metrics are simply left out okay that's financial statements that might be a theme of the webinar well, let's look just briefly at financial journalism, one of my favorite topics, actually. Remembering the financial crisis, 2008, 2009, etc., and the constant talk of spreading disease metaphors, contagions, and the need to stop contagions, therefore, nearly a trillion dollars had to be taken out of the federal fisc and deployed in certain ways. Well, that's a lot of activity and a lot of taxpayer money to move around based on a mere metaphor. The metaphors were never explained in detail or related to actual facts. That was the frustration I felt reading these things back then. Well, again, the Wall Street Journal, but this time from August 2016, an article which I think is very valuable, entitled, Nothing Says Monetary Policy Like Sinks and Sledgehammers, focusing on monetary policy, that is the policy of central banks to alter the economy in various ways. The article begins with, when the Bank of England cut interest rates and announced bond buying program this month, no kitchen sink was left standing. The metaphor using everything, but or throwing everything but the kitchen sink at something is an old metaphor, but it refers to using every instrument at the Bank of England's disposal. The article summarizes by saying, sink throwing has joined sledgehammers, bullets, firepower, and dry powder among the metaphors proliferating around central bank policy. One analyst described European central bank officials as, quote, craved to trigger a final bazooka, end quote, to push inflation to its target. The European Central Bank was said to be drumming big beats and firing on all cylinders. One analyst was calling later for a cliche ceasefire, and I quote from what that analyst said. 
Here's the problem I have with metaphors. Sometimes you don't give a true picture of what's happening. I am worried that these metaphors are reinforcing a view that central banks can do something about the situation we are facing, end quote. Which poses the possibilities that the evocative intensity of such metaphors is inversely related to the potency of central bank management, as if they're overcompensating. One central bank manager, a former Bank of England rate setter named Adam Posen said, in response to people on central bank staffs being called hawks or doves, depending upon how they viewed Fed policy, is quoted as saying, I personally have always disliked the hawk also because again, it goes to this faux machismo. Oh, we are tough birds of prey. We hunt, we are tough. We're just a bunch of guys and a few women in ties. This is not the joint chiefs of staff. <laughs> I enjoy that. Uh, kudos to you, Adam Posen. And finally, in a speech earlier in the summer of 2016, Bank of England chief economist Andy Haldane said he would, quote, rather run the risk of taking a sledgehammer to crack a nut than taking a miniature rock hammer to tunnel my way out of prison, end quote. He's referring to a specific policy direction Bank of England was taking. The article points out that following that announcement, sledgehammers had their best week in media stories in Factiva's recorded history, Factiva measuring mentions and, and word usage in journalism generally. So you talk about punch bowls, you talk about sledgehammers, you talk about hawks and doves and throwing the kitchen sink, and there's a host of other journalists out there to parrot what you say, all leading to the Financial Poise webinar, Personal Finance and Investing Fundamentals 2.0, Episode 2, How to Read Financial Statements and Financial Journalism. Let us enjoy the interview. We have with us Jeff Kelly and John Drachman. Jeff Kelly has over 20 years experience in financial services operations management and was named Chief Operating Officer of Sterling Trust, which is now known as Equity Institutional, in 2008. He's also had executive positions overseeing qualified plans and managing trading operations and has worked as a registered investment advisor. Mr. Kelly is also an accredited retirement plan consultant through the Society of Professional Administrators and Record Keepers. John Drachman is an award-winning writer and develops marketing communications initiatives for money managers and has done so for more than 20 years. John is also a Series 7 registered representative. Jeff and John have both been on the show before. You can look in the archives and hear more from the two of them. Welcome, Jeff and John. Good to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you, yes. All right, so today we'll talk about, among other things, the Department of Labor fiduciary rules and their impact on investing. Listener, do not run. This rule is one of those important things that journalists have trouble writing about and which mass media editors have trouble justifying putting on the air or on the page. But I assure you, it's important to anyone who is planning for retirement. One of the roles played by those who help those who are planning for retirement is that of custodians of the assets that might be deployed. And Jeff in his professional life is that. He helps run a custodial shop. So Jeff Kelly, what are custodians and what role do they play in retirement investment? Yes, this is Jeff with Equity Institutional, a division of Equity Trust Company, and we are a custodian. There's a lot of terms out there for custodian, and there's a lot of entities out there who are a custodian, though they may not refer to themselves as a custodian. But in its simplest terms, a custodian or qualified custodian is defined by the IRS, and it is an entity that is, under law, allowed to hold, take possession of, for the benefit of the client, IRA assets and qualified plan assets. 
the definition of custodian includes different types of firms. One would be a brokerage firm or broker dealer. Insurance companies and banks also fall into that definition. And there is a segment of the industry in which equity trust is a part of as an independent directed custodian, which is a custodian who is only in the business to provide the backroom services, hold the assets, execute investment instructions. And unlike some of the banks and brokerage firms throughout our nation, we do not offer investment products or investment advice. We only accept instructions from our clients and execute those instructions based on the investments they choose. Okay, and could you comment, Jeff, on the sorts of assets that might be used within the constraints you mentioned earlier? I forgot what they were, qualified something or other. Sure, and this does play right into our discussion topic today. There are specific asset types that are allowed as investments in individual retirement accounts and qualified plans, and those are best defined by the IRS guidelines of the disallowed or prohibited types of investments in retirement accounts, which include collectibles and things such as that. So once you get outside the scope of those, the small population as defined in, by the Internal Revenue Service as a prohibited investment for retirement account, virtually every other type of asset under the sun is allowed and how that ties to this rule. And just as, a, as an aside, the original version of the rule included a much more expanded list of assets that would not be allowed inside of individual retirement accounts and business retirement plans. However, that portion of the rule was eliminated in the last pass, which gives investors more flexibility. Okay, so equity ownership in private companies, gold, futures contracts, are those things that could be in an uh, individual retirement account? Absolutely. All of those investments do not fall into the category of a prohibited investment, such as a, as a collectible, as I mentioned. So they are allowed in individual retirement accounts. All right, so you're a custodian, and you're pretty strictly a custodian from what I'm hearing. And that's different from somebody who gives advice or steers people towards investments. And I'm referring to two animals we'll talk about at length, uh, advisors, registered investment advisors, and brokers. So the Department of Labor rule, which I'm going to talk about for a minute since I'm the lawyer on the call, really is aimed at the, the brokers and the registered investment advisors, not the custodians, which are all in this together in certain ways. So what is the DOL rule? Well, the DOL rule is a rule under, I should say that uh, our agencies can't just make rules willy-nilly. They have to be under acts of Congress that have been uh, enacted either through presidential signing or through a uh, overriding of a presidential veto. And the law involved is the Employee Retirement Income and Security Act, otherwise known to everybody as ERISA. That's the acronym everybody knows. Under that law, the DOL can issue rules. One of those rules is the DOL fiduciary rule, which became effective this year in June, will become applicable next year in April and fully applicable the following year in January. Well, okay, what does it do? Well, I guess in short, and we'll look to John to make, uh, John Drachman to correct all of my errors in this description. In short, Everybody who provides investment advice on retirement, and that includes those who call themselves advisors and those who do not, but everybody who does are expected to act as fiduciaries. And this includes whether you're recommending products or recommending somebody to recommend products. And it's my understanding that registered investment advisors have always adhered to this standard, which involves uh, acting in the best interests of those they're advising, giving advice that would turn them toward the best products. But in prior to this, brokers were held to a lower suitability standard. They could point their advisees, using the term loosely, 
support products, which were okay, they were suitable, but the brokers could do that out of a desire to make commissions off their sales as opposed to fees from the advisees. So now brokers have to do something different and advisors have to continue doing what they do with regard to recommending products or recommending other professionals uh, working on those products. I should mention that there have been challenges to the rule that are percolating through the federal courts. One of them says, well, there's a problem with the Department of Labor issuing a uh, rule which creates a private cause of action. I'll leave that to the lawyers in the audience. But I wanted to comment, and again, hear from our panelists, that through all of the journalism on the Department of Labor rule, what I haven't seen is anything pointing out exactly the and measuring the level of harm that had been inflicted on advisees in the past and the way in which the rule would presumably lower that harm. I am guessing that in the papers in these lawsuits, we'll find the answers to some of those questions. Okay, Jeff, John, are there important things missing or to be corrected in that description? Well, this is uh, John Trockman of Alpha Segment. To, to give this a bit more context, Chris, I'd like to just put out some dates that are there. As of today, nothing has really changed. So it's business as usual, but beginning on April 10th of next year, 2017, the Department of Labor is expecting the implementation of these fiduciary standards to begin at the different firms. It's called a phased implementation approach to be fully implemented by January 1 of 2018. So in the minds of the broker dealers, the RIAs, there's, there's that deadline looming. So there's quite a bit of anxiety, curiosity, but there's also, I would have to say, there a lot of embracing of the rule. Let's go along with this. In the long run, it's better, probably better for the client. In other words, the leopard seems to be willing to change its spots here. Even though there are some, there's resistance from a number of trade associations and there's uh, even uh, some lawsuits out there, the, this rule, the sentiment is it's going to go forward. And so... Another couple of dates I'd like to put out there that just gives uh, some some context for the avalanche of retirement assets that's in play here is if you go back to 1994, and uh, this is all posted on the Department of Labor site, retirement assets were pretty evenly divided between the classic pension plans, um, the uh, D.C. plans, and rollovers at the $2 trillion level, more or less, all right? But with the beginning of the retirement of the baby boomers, which, believe it or not, started uh, the older baby boomers started retiring in their 50s around 2004, 2005, you see this spike of assets um, going into rollovers, rollover IRAs, coming out of D.C. plans, which start to flatten. Traditional pensions would start to flatten. So the most recent figures of 2014, that's the most recent data we have, the rollover IRA market is at just over $7 trillion, almost twice the size of the traditional pension plans, and maybe 50% more than in the D.C. market. So there's this incredible money in motion thing that's happening, and Congress, the President of the United States, everybody noticed this uh, a couple of years ago, that the people's assets where the demographics, people living longer, had to be protected in some way. So there was this zeroing in on the kinds of commissions and fees that were charged only in the retirement plan area. Like you said, Chris, only has to do with the retirement plans. But there are some figures out there about, and I don't have the numbers handy, but it's in the billions in dollars of lost equity, if you will, in retirement plans due to conflicted advice, or hidden fees, they call them backdoor fees. There's a lot of ways to get paid in the investment business. I've got a quote from- Okay, so we're talking about two different payment models. Now looking at the investor, uh, the person who goes into the office to find out what to do about his or her retirement. 
So that yeah. investor can go in and say, hello, Mr. Registered Investment Advisor, please handle my, you know, $1.5 million uh, level of assets. And I'd like to create an appropriate retirement set of retirement investments. And the investment advisor says my fee is X. And then the person pays that. Now, the other model would be yeah. walking in and, and saying, hello, Mr. Whatever his name is, her name, who really is a broker. Uh -huh. And uh, would you handle my uh -huh. $110,000? I'm only intentionally using a smaller figure. $110,000 uh, yeah. set of assets so that I can maximize my return in retirement, which is coming up in eight years. And then the broker does whatever the right. broker does. And there's no fee. Ah, but the broker gets a commission from those suppliers of the investments that he directs the person into, and that's two different models. Well, what will happen when, now that the uh, brokers have to, they, in most cases anyway, and, and you'll talk about an exception. Yes. If the broker has to adhere to a fiduciary level and therefore cannot steer things for his own benefit, but has to act in the in the best interests of the client, well, the broker is uh -huh. not going to be as able to make money off commissions. We'll have to charge fees. Might that not cause problems for those who are investing with less, less money? It could, and it probably will. It'll probably be more difficult because transition period of investment on the part of the broker dealers. And just to be clear, the RIAs still have to adhere to the same rules, but you're right that they are closer to the implementation of a fiduciary standard just in the way they conduct their business. Very often they're financial planners, so they get a fee. They have a sort of same side of the table, relationship-based, a consulting approach that counts on developing an investment policy statement usually before any investing takes place. There's a transparency thing that happens where the client sees, okay, this is what I'm agreeing to. And that's going to be, that kind of way of thinking is going to be very new for brokers. Okay. You have to really qualify your investors, know what's in their best interest before you recommend products. Well, I didn't mean to bang on the criticism of the rule, which I was just alluding to, but just rather to kind of present that criticism out there. The rule is there, it's coming. And unless one of these lawsuits knocks it out, it's, it will be here. And as you say, everybody is planning for it. John, you, you've talked a little bit about this, but I want, just wanted to get it down straight before we move on to the next set of questions. So life is going to change for registered investment advisors, but it's going to change more for brokers or whoever goes under the name or investment advise, advisors of other kinds, whatever they're called, who make their money from commissions from purveyors of investment products. Life is going to change for them. Can you elucidate a little bit how? Well, they're going to have to embrace the rule. Fortunately, there's some good practice management tools out there. I know that one of the big fund administrators, the SEI network, has got some good tools out there to show people who are trying to get up to speed, the commission-based brokers, what they have to do. It, it really is an awareness effort on their part to understand how these long-term, they're also part of some long-term trends that are taking place in regard to how portfolios are constructed. In order to use the rule as a prospecting technique for a commission-based broker who is getting up to speed, this is a great time to use it as a prospecting tool to uh, show uh, to explain and elucidate to these lower asset clients what a fiduciary does and how it works and why this is important. It can give them a distinctive advantage and a leg up if they take the time to, to learn what the rule's about. And additionally, there's some fairly low-cost technology solutions out there that can help them in the qualifying process. They can't just sell products in a vacuum. They do have to do a better job of documenting what they're talking to clients about, how they're evaluating needs and objectives. So some good software programs out there that can help them and certainly becoming expert in the benefits of rollover IRAs because that's where the assets are 
coming from anyway. They, that's an expertise that they can leverage because presumably they've been, been selling those IRAs. Here's another way to look at it. And finally, to gain a little familiarity with the best interest contract exemption, what's called BICE. And what this simply is, it's a, it, it's a way of saying, look, I'm your commission-based broker, all right? But I really believe in this proprietary product we have at uh, John Drockman Asset Management. And I do get a certain type of commission on that, but it's a good product, and I need you to sign this as a, an understanding between the two of us that you know that I have a conflict. Now, a lot of people aren't going to want to do that, but if you have the conviction in a certain product, if a broker has strong enough feelings, this is a way to to sell it under the DOL rule. And presumably, as paper-heavy as such compliance might seem or become, over time, you're able to manage that better through repetition and through a helpful software and so forth. You've got it. And if, you, if they take a page from the investment policy statement approach on the RIA side of the market, where good questionnaires, good qualifying practices bring everything together, this can be an addendum to that. It, just, it can be an extension of, of just the qualification process. Oh, people don't like to learn new things. Come on. I'm kidding. Well, there you go. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> let's, let's, let's turn, let's turn this a little bit. Jeff is familiar with the actual assets themselves. And we alluded to this earlier. Usually when you go in to get investment advice, or when you picture people going in to get investment advice, you're picturing them buying, you know, mutual funds or interests in some fund or another, or, or uh, an index fund, buying securities indirectly through or directly through an index fund. Well, equity securities, securities themselves are not the entire game. Jeff Kelly, does the scope of this rule also apply to non-securities assets that might be part of a given retirement plan? That is a very good question. And it does deserve a bit of time and clarification on this. Because the rule, as it's written, it is based on the advice given and not the person giving the advice or the asset, it truly could apply to all things. If you are, in, in fact, dealing with any commission-based product, then, of course, you're going to be running into this new BICE agreement. But there is a very interesting segment of our industry to point out as we talk about the alternative investment industry. While the rule does apply to the advice giver, there is a segment in our market that is very large in the retirement account industry, and that is precious metals. And there seems to be a lot of question that needs clarification around this. If you take the rule verbatim as it's written, and it is based on the individual giving the advice, can be a broker, registered investment advisor, you could in fact say that if you are dealing with the precious metal broker, there could potentially be a sales pitch or advice given in the conversation. Then you look to the other side of the coin and you look at the four groups that are exempt from this new DOL rule. One of the four is would be people who do not represent themselves as fiduciaries and make it clear that they are acting for a purchaser or seller on the other side of the transaction. If you're talking about precious metals from that standpoint, clearly that segment of investment type would be exempted from this rule. However, if you delve down into the sales pitch, there could be a conflict there where someone is almost giving advice when they're trying to have a precious metals transaction executed by a client. So I guess that's a long way to say that the rule applies to the individual giving the advice, but there is a bit of clarification still needed with respect to this specific asset type, and I'm sure there are others that will come up, as they always do, through 
events in the industry as this goes into effect. All right. So you're a custodian. Individuals come directly to you. And individuals come to you as a result, or, or I should say maybe advisors and others come to you to help individuals acquire specific assets. And you have the desire to avoid falling under the regulatory ambit of the DOL. And by the way, the word ambit is used by nobody but lawyers. Okay, so if you want to stay away from that ambit, how do you do that? The first way you do that is by being a true independent direct custodian and not providing advice. Of course, if you are a custodian and you choose to provide advice, you probably reduce your relationship with those who are in the advice industry due to a conflict there. But the first step really is the custodian not providing advice. But in addition to that, this rule expands even more to the custodian not providing options to individuals for advice givers. That creates significant challenges under the new rule. And it's interesting to note in the industry, as we're seeing these firms preparing for the onset of the rule, we're seeing custodians, and we mentioned earlier the the various categories of custodians. We're seeing custodians in the industry begin to shrink their offerings. And a good example would be as you look at some of the larger insurance companies across the country who their bread and butter and what they were created upon was providing insurance products. And that naturally expanded into financial services where they could cross-sell various advice products. We're starting to see a move in that industry of some of the larger firms even eliminating the advice divisions so that they can just focus on the product side. And while they're still a custodian, they're not a custodian giving advice. So it will be really interesting to see how much this contraction continues as we go forward. Yes, that might explain why I'm not getting calls from that insurance guy anymore who always wanted to be my investment advisor as well. Exactly. You know those guys. <laughs> they're, they're relentless. Well, let me ask you a practical question, Jeff. How often do you have to say, I'm not giving you advice? And I'm speaking as an attorney, and when you are not engaged by somebody, you're always tempted to help solve their problem, you know, perhaps, even if notionally, or give them something to walk away with. But you have to make sure that you tell them, and if possible, get it in writing that you are not their lawyer, you are not giving advice. So how often do you do it? Every third sentence, every conversation once? How do you do it? You know, that's a really interesting question. As I think back through our time, we generally run into that conversation on a daily basis where we have individuals who either have been working with us for a period of time or come to us as a new client and go through the process. Uh, They know what they want to do, but it eventually evolves into, do you have any more magic bullets for me? What else could I be doing, et cetera? And that really is a daily question with us that we get, and we have to continually, you know, in the proper way, explain that, number one, we do not provide that advice, and number two, probably want us to stick to our area of expertise and not get into the advice business. That'll probably be best for all. (laughs) So if I say gold or platinum, you're going to give me a little lecture. (laughs) Exactly. Yes. (laughs) Well, all right. Well, let me turn that question around. If you were counseling a person, not about investing, but about going to a custodian, what is it an investor should expect and what is it investors should seek from a custodian and how should an investor be able to decide one custodian is better than another? Yeah, that's pretty simple. Uh, The first would be a clear understanding of fees. Those are always important. The scope of services, the areas of expertise, for example, with equity trust, the focus in alternative investments would be our area of expertise in addition to other things, but that is really what we focus on, and you would want to make sure that if 
your interest is alternative investments, you verify up front with your custodian that it is something they not only can handle but understand, and they can help you with the processing roadblocks that uh, you may run into as these transactions sometimes are not seamless and not purely electronic. You would also want to make sure you understand whether that custodian does have other proprietary products that you may be getting those calls about. If you're not interested in something like that, you would probably be better served by steering yourself to an independent custodian as opposed to a true full financial service company and avoid those conversations oh, that we're we'll talking this. about shortly. Yes, yeah. cross -selling. Um, unfortunately, cross-selling is going to be in, put together in a public mind with Wells Fargo because of the current controversy surrounding that company. But in this case, you are under the DOL rule. It's best perhaps to seek people who stay in their lane, huh? That would be the best advice that you could give. All right. John, final thoughts on this, because we were talking about the DOL rule. We've been talking about custodians in the shadow of DOL rule. A final thoughts from you that you may have come up with while, uh, while Jeff was speaking. One final thought is that buried in the DOL rule is a, a section about general retirement planning information. It is perfectly permissible for broker dealers or brokers who are trying to get up to speed uh, to continue a dialogue that sketches out the challenges and solutions that are involved in retirement planning as a challenge, as a concept, uh, without the product. So, you know, why would they want to do that? Well, it could be um, you could use that as a sort of a stepping stone to the sales department, to a more qualified individual while that individual broker is trying to get up to speed and be able to sell it at this new level. So I think that's, there, there's still an opportunity there to talk about retirement investments just short of the product. I think that could be valuable for, uh, for some of the brokers. Give them a chance to buy some time. Notwithstanding the DOL rule. Got it. Well, Jeff Kelly of Equity Institution and John Drachman of Alpha Segment, it's been a pleasure again to have you on the show. Thanks for having us. You've been listening to Reflections on the DOL Rule on Financial Poise Radio. I am Christopher Cahill, the host. Financial Poise Radio is produced by Stephanie Strait. We thank you all for listening very, very much. Let's do this again sometime soon. Thank you for joining us. If you enjoyed this episode, you can subscribe through iTunes or Stitcher, or you can download our app from Libsyn. You can also listen right on our website, www.financialpoise.com. Each week, Financial Poise Radio brings you news and education about finance, investing, business, and law. To see a short written summary of this episode, go to www.financialpoise.com. Financial Poise Radio is a production of Financial Poise Radio Productions, LLC.